from Tokyo my dear dear friends this is Daisuke and I very much hope that this video finds you well and in very very good spirits wherever you are in the world and today if you don't mind I would very much like to begin a discussion or a an exploration of one of the films that was directed by the extraordinary filmmaker artist from Greece and his name is uh, Theodorus Angelopoulos, or Theo Angelopoulos. Now, Angelopoulos's body of work is extraordinary. One of the most extraordinary uh, bodies of work that I have ever had the great pleasure of coming across and engaging with uh, in terms of, of viewership. The films of Angelopoulos are uh, truly breathtaking, each in their own way. And they have these uh, approaches to cinema, approaches to time, approaches to uh, space and spatial concerns and character, as well as presentations of information on the one hand. Also, there is this sense of intriguing connection to past and present, to political concerns, social economic concerns that are both of the moment and also echoing uh, say the immediate past or maybe the ancient past and this echoing of ancient past is also expressed in terms of treatment and handling or reworking or reimagining in some forms of that phrase or those phrases uh, uh, figures of Greek mythology or Greek drama and so there is so much uh, here embedded within the uh, the hallmarks and landmarks of the films of Angelopoulos. Now, I will say uh, this comment perhaps many times, uh, which is that I am in no way an expert when it comes to Greek history or when it comes to uh, Greek drama or theater or Greek cinema. But I do uh, approach the works of Angelopoulos as a viewer of the films and based on that viewership I have done my best to try to uh, to try to uh, uh, understand as best as I can uh, what the significant points of these films are. Now once again I must stress that my understanding will be very shallow and uh, very incomplete uh, but I will do my very best in these discussions and so uh, if you have any additional points or corrections or any other matters that you would like to uh, talk to me about or talk to us about when we are discussing these films of Angelopoulos please of course feel free at any time to let me know in the comment section below of these or other videos again I am looking forward very much to our discussions of these works by the great artist uh, Theo Angelopoulos. I should say too before I begin that I understand that maybe a number of these films might be very difficult to obtain or watch and so I understand that maybe for some uh, it might be difficult for instance to get a copy of this film The Reconstruction. Now I have the DVD here from the United Kingdom uh, from some time back and it's a great DVD by the way. Uh, but if you haven't seen the film yet and you still want to engage in this discussion, I will do my best to remain as spoiler-free as possible. But please also understand that I will uh, rely on certain uh, discussions of plot uh, of the film, although again trying to be as vague or ambiguous as possible. But uh, So please, uh, I hope that's okay um, for anyone who has yet to see these films. Again, I will do my best to avoid spoilers, but at the same time uh, I will need to speak to at least uh, to a certain degree some of the plot elements of this film. So again, just for anyone who has, uh, for anyone who's interested uh, before we continue on with our discussion of the film. Now, with all that being said, let us now turn our attention to the first feature film that was directed by Angelopoulos. And it is known, and please pardon me for my very, very poor uh, pronunciation, uh, but it is uh, titled 
anaparastasis, and this is from the year 1970. It is oftentimes referred to in English under the title of the reconstruction. The reconstruction, or anaparastasis from 1970, is essentially a tale which could be said to be based on a type of newspaper or almost even a tabloid type of noirish murder film uh, and uh, a reconstruction or a, a retelling of the various events that either led up to or followed subsequent to this particular event which was the death or the murder of this individual, this man who was a husband to this woman, the woman being Eleni and the man being Kostas. And there is another man here who is the lover of Eleni and this is Christos. And here we have a type of love triangle of sorts which seems to be somehow related to these events leading to the death or the killing of the husband of Eleni. And herein we have the central event of the film and surrounding this event we have depictions or story elements involving these characters and how they are handling the event in question, where the event is taking place. Now this is also a very important point of the film. It is taking place within this uh, very small uh, village in northern Greece and it is uh, somewhat isolated from, say, other uh, urban centers of, uh, of the country. And so we have this uh, very isolated area with a very, very small population. And this is the backdrop or the environment against which these events are taking place. Primarily in the setting, there are some uh, scenes that take place a little bit uh, outside of this area, but primarily in the setting. Also, we have here the the interesting use of time and space. Now, what do I mean by this? The use of time and space is very fascinating because we don't get a chronological depiction of the story from, say, point A to point B to point C chronologically. We actually get different scenes that jump in time. For instance, we suddenly are abruptly taken, perhaps, due to, um, in some terms of the pace of the story, we might be seeing, say, the husband returning to the village, returning to the home, returning to his wife, Eleni, and their children at the very start, leading up to the opening titles of the film. And then suddenly, we'll be taken to a scene that involves the questioning of Eleni by certain authority figures. The assumption being that we are now cut to a point in time where the killing has already taken place off screen and now we see Eleni being questioned as a suspect to that particular killing and also we get the information about how she might have been uh, working or she might have been acting in cahoots with her lover who is the character of Christos. So we have this as an example and this starts the film. This starts the film and we have this as a type of example of how the film shifts back and forth in time because then from here we go to elements or inst or instances or moments in time immediately following the killing so we see the two of them uh, the lovers uh, trying to deal with how to hide the body or trying to deal with the aftermath hiding the crime and also we get cut back to the questioning of the suspects as it were and then we see or we get the sense of the questioning of how maybe there is a little bit or perhaps not a little bit quite a significant divide or tension between the two lovers again neither of whom uh, is necessarily wanting to admit who actually did the act of killing uh, maybe they're saying that it was the other person and the other person saying oh, it was her it was him etc so they are not necessarily uh, there is a sense therefore that the interrogation is uh, revealing certain uh, schisms between uh, the two of them. And then we cut back to back in time, back to the immediate aftermath period before they have been apprehended, before they have been arrested, and trying to cover up their tracks and also trying to, let's say, uh, deal with the situation, deal with themselves, trying to get an emotional framework as to what their relationship is, both emotionally and physically and sexually. And then we go back in time or back forward in time, shall I say, to the interrogation period and the 
the questioning and the reconstruction of the crime, as it were, perhaps thus leading to the English title of the film, The Reconstruction. And then we go shift uh, back and forth in time in this respect. Now, this already is an extraordinary balance of, say, the tabloid or maybe the tawdry type of, of uh, sensational crime uh, that might be said to be at the center of this film in terms of, of looking at it as a murder film or a type of crime film or a true crime film together with a sense of a, the police procedural. Uh, and so in that sense, we have this element set forth, I think, very brilliantly and I think in a very direct manner. It's made all the more uh, incredible by the fact that it is a very reserved approach to the, uh, the, the, the process or the stylings. In other words, this story, which can be also described as a type of noirish murder, uh, true crime police procedural, in, those, in that vein, it might be said to be uh, following certain aspects of those genres. But at the same time, it's amazing because very little is shown directly uh, in fact, not at all. We're not seeing, uh, we don't see specifically uh, the elements, if you will, of the actual crime involved, or we don't see elements of the, of the specifics of what happened. We only get the aftermath, or we only get the reconstruction, or we get the, the relationship between the two lovers. We never get the actual event, and so it becomes this, this uh, remarkable thing how the entire film, the film noir uh, mystery police procedural, a true crime element of the film, is premised upon a scene, the crime scene, or the crime itself, that we never actually see. Now that is in a very extraordinary way to present information, even in the context of this true crime film genre. And so this is, I think, a, an example of how the film is relying on certain, say, genre traits or expectations, but then, uh, but then maybe turning those on their head in a very subtle and pr very powerful way, thus giving us, the viewer, the opportunity to focus on other elements of the film. For example, the way that the characters are reacting to this particular situation. We see, for instance, the lover, the character of Christos, and how he seems to be reacting or somewhat agitated. Maybe they try to go off to uh, a nearby town and we see his reaction and how he wants to get out of the, the, the room, walk the streets until nighttime. And maybe that's a suggestion of a type of agitation that he is feeling or nervousness that he is feeling vis-a-vis -vis what he has done and also vis-a-vis -vis his relationship with um, his lover, uh, the wife. Uh, Eleni. And then we also get a sense of Eleni too, this, uh, this character who is uh, in many ways the, the primary character of this film. She is the wife and she is the one who is involved in this killing. And we see how she is trying to deal almost in a very methodical way with the getting rid of the, the evidence, getting rid of the stuff and trying to uh, get away with uh, the crime. But what is so fascinating, too, about these character presentations is that while it might be suggested that we might get a sense of what the character or psychological effects of this crime are, we also are not privy to what the actual specific reasons for this crime taking place are to begin with. In fact, it's arguable that uh, it's an arguable stance to take in terms of a, of a uh, of an interpretation of this film that we don't really know why the crime was committed to begin with. We might get a sense of how it was, the mechanics of it, uh, who actually did it, what, what, what happened to the evidence afterwards, but we're not really sure specifically what the reasons are. And this makes Eleni, the wife character, I think a very fascinating one. We know and yet we don't know. There are things that we see from her actions and yet we can only ponder as to what those specific reasons were for her to want to do what it was she ended up doing or she ended up being involved in. And so there is also a way in which this film is giving us a psychological portrait of these characters, say in the context of the true crime film genre, and in also turning that presentation on its head by, again, withholding the information directly to us as to, say, the specific reasonings as to why the crime was committed and what happened and what were the reasons. And we can only 
uh, uh, we can only uh, consider, or we can ponder, or we can guess. And I think there are a number of clues that are embedded throughout the rest of the film that might give us a hint or an indication as to why this happened the way it happened. But my point here is that we get information, and yet information is withheld from us in uh, certain aspects of the true crime genre and also in the psychological portraits of the character. And here is also a very, I think, key example of maybe the stylings or the presentation or the visual or the cinematic aesthetic of Angelopolis in this film. And perhaps we will see this uh, played out in different forms in the films to come. But this is a very important, or these are important points, I would suggest, that form part of the discussion of the reconstruction. Now, that brings us to another very key component of this film, which is the social and political and economic implications that are indeed the historical implications that are uh, undoubtedly embedded uh, uh, into the very heart and soul of this film, I would suggest. Now, again, I am not an expert. I am not an expert when it comes to Greek history or Greek, uh, Greek drama or uh, uh, modern history or ancient history. Uh, but I do, uh, I, I, I have tried my best to, uh, to, uh, 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 to study up on it, as it were. And so my comments are very shallow and very, uh, very lacking in any kind of um, uh, uh, intellectual strength, as it were. But uh, the way my understanding is, based on what I have researched, is we have here a story that is essentially taking place in this period of time, you know, the, the late 60s, the film is uh, made or released in 1970. And so we have uh, to keep in mind another thing. Now, we have to keep in mind a number of things. First, this is a story that is taking place in this isolated village in northern Greece. And this village, we understand from the very start of the film, has a population that has dwindled over time, over the recent time of the 20th century, it has dwindled to a very, very small population. And so that is one thing. And so we see a village that is very lightly populated. We don't see a lot of people. We see a number of villagers, but not so many. And we indeed get a, an, a sort of introductory narration that also uh, emphasizes this fact that this is a population, or this is a low population village in northern Greece. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Also, we understand from the very beginning that the husband, uh, Eleni's husband, um, uh, Kostas, has returned from Germany, from abroad. And so he, has re he is part of what is known or what I understand to be uh, the workforce or the population that emigrated out of Greece into other parts of Europe, such as Germany, in order to follow uh, certain uh, labor opportunities. And so this is also an indication of sort of a type of, of, of uh, a population movement or movement of peoples or emigration away from the villages into not just urban areas outside of villages within the country of Greece, but also outside of Greece into other countries as well. So this might go along, or this might be one of the reasons to explain why the villages or the village here in question is so lowly populated the way it is. We have uh, perhaps that type of flow of people that, we have, that uh, the, the, uh, the country of Greece has seen uh, since the early part of the 20th century. And also that has a social and economic consequence uh, to the particular landscape. So we see here uh, a village that we guess or we sense or we intuit might not be in the most, uh, say, prosperous of economic situations. Uh, there is a way that this is also maybe artistically presented in terms of the visual stylings. It has a very monotone look to it. Uh, there is a sense of, of um, there is no, say, focus on a type of, of, of advances of, say, uh, technological or municipal-based technologies uh, that are evident in the community. Uh, there is a community there, but uh, and this is also presented in, in a sort of the monotone earth tones. The sky is often gray or there's rain as well. And so there is this sense of, of a type of isolation uh, when the village is depicted. Also, this is further uh, further embellished when we get outside of the town or outside the village into the town area. And we see or we sense already uh, when with Eleni and Christos in their story. And we see that that divide even further uh, 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 
uh, further emphasized as well. And so there is a sense of real isolation in this particular village. Now, that I think is, is uh, suggestive of a social and economic situation of the villages, of the rural life, uh, and the low and the decreasing population, and the return of the husband, a reminder of the decreasing populations of certain parts of the of the country, in particular the northern parts, the, the village areas of the northern parts. So this is, I think, a very key component to keep in mind. Um, the return of the husband, too, is very important because, uh, again, it's an indication of the social socioeconomic consequences of the time, uh, the, mid to, uh, the, the mid the uh, mid 20th century years and beyond. And also there is a link to ancient Greece, or to be more specific, maybe Greek mythology or figures of Greek mythology and drama. And I'm speaking, for example, of the story of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, as we've seen, uh, for example, in uh, Aeschylus and Orstea, and, we, and the return of Agamemnon and the, the killing of Agamemnon. Uh, and so perhaps in that way, uh, the, Ag the Agamemnon story, the Agamemnon figure can be shown or, or is being worked or in this film, or perhaps the character of the husband is standing in for the Agamemnon figure of the story. And thus, Eleni, the wife, is standing in for the role of Clytemnestra and uh, the lover, of course, and the, the killing of the husband and the return from uh, abroad, the return from a far off land back to the home and what happens to Agamemnon, the, the fate of Agamemnon and the fate of, the fate of Agamemnon and the fate of uh, the husband Costas and the role of Eleni and the role of the lover. Etc. So Clytemnestra. However, however, we also have to remember that this could be said to be kind of reworking uh, or reimagining of this type of uh, of myth or storytelling. Because uh, while the roles might be somewhat or quite similar, in fact, almost identical in terms of the role of the the, the husband, wife, and lover, etc., and what happens, there is also a kind of reversal because we are reminded of maybe the economic dire straits, uh, what the economic Economic situations or necessities that had the husband leave the house or leave the town to begin with to go to another country and then come back. And we also see maybe a, or sense the economic hardships that are expressed in this village life, Eleni and the lover. And so rather than be the story of, say, uh, kings and queens or the story of, say, uh, the upper classes, uh, rather it is a story of the of the village life or the rural life. And so in that way, it's almost uh, uh, putting on its head uh, the whole idea of the roles of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra. And so it's almost uh, a kind of reversal of those roles in, in the social, socioeconomic and political context of the film. And this is very fascinating too, because we will see, we have seen in this film arguably, and we will see in other films, just how uh, Agamelopoulos will try to, or will indeed uh, take or adapt or adopt certain aspects of myth and theater and drama uh, but then also turn them on their head. And uh, perhaps we will see this, uh, for instance, in a later film that I hope to discuss soon, which is called in English, The Traveling Players. But I would also argue that it's, uh, it's here and it's being presented in this very, very uh, direct and also uh, an interesting reversal type of way. Uh, so uh, we have this reworking of a past and present, but that past is also, uh, uh, well, it's a reworking of the past. It's also uh, paying reverence to the past at the same time. So it is a direct homage, but it is also a retelling of sorts. So uh, this is one of the, another fascinating aspect of this film, and then also uh, maybe an echo of what's to come in the feature films of Angelopoulos. Uh, so uh, I think in general, or in, in some, uh, we have the this film, The Reconstruction, that has so much in terms of the visual stylings, the way in which time and space are treated, the jumps, and those jumps, I should say too, before I end, those jumps are not announced. There is no type of, of, of a set structure that will signal to us that, okay, now we're going to go to the past, or now we're going to go back to the present. No, those, those jumps are sudden uh, with the simplicity of a cut, 
it's an edit from one scene to another that brings us to a completely different time and space. And so this too gives us a sense of challenge. It, it has to uh, allow us or it makes us have to uh, catch our bearings as to where we are in space and time. So this is very, very important too. And we see uh, the treatment of time and space as being in, in many ways to almost a transcend, uh, uh, way to transcend uh, certain elements of the storyline. In fact, this is a story about murder and lust and, and in many ways types of, of the, the human passions that take control of us uh, and the results, the end results and the tragic end results of that. And so, but in many ways, the way in which this film goes back and forth in time uh, we see people that we understand were killed or if we see things happen after the fact but then we go back it's almost like in this working or reworking of time and space uh, life and death are almost transcendent into this idea of myth and drama and indeed what is the the one of the great glory uh, glory uh, glorious points of uh, uh, Greek myth and drama, uh, but f the idea of it transcending something beyond the story uh, and giving us uh, something of a symbol or something of a, of, a, of a statement on life, humanity, and existence. And so this is, I think, another kind of parallel way that Angelopoulos and company are working with or treating the sense of drama of, uh, of uh, ancient times and then putting it in this modern context and indeed in this context of cinema. And so this is another strong hallmark of what we will see in the stylings of Angelopoulos going forward. Again, the treatment of space and time, sometimes within a single shot or just a single edit, but it is extraordinary the, the amount of, of uh, terrain, uh, temporal and spatial terrain that is traversed by the, uh, the brilliance of the cinematic and visual and uh, the visual style of the filmmaker Theo Angelopoulos, as shown in this film, which is The Reconstruction. So, my dear friends, so that's it for now. Uh, if you have any comments about this film, The Reconstruction, please let me know in the comments section below. I would very much love to hear what it is you have to say. Um, otherwise, my dear friends, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining me on this discussion, and I hope to continue the discussions with the films of Angelopoulos in a chronological order going forward. Uh, so please join me if you are interested. And until then, my friends, please be happy and healthy and well, and please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. Thank you so much, as always, for your time. I very much appreciate it. Stay strong, stay safe, and cheers. Thank you.